I'm going to afford golden microphone, but I'll use it right now. Just let you know we're going to start the presentation here. I want to respect the uh, time you're putting in here and not keep you too long, so we'll get going. All right, I'll keep the microphone here. So thanks for, uh, for coming, everybody. My name is Tom Cardozer. I'm the Director of Business Services for the uh, Maguanagoon Area School District. Uh, we're going to make a presentation here about our long-range facility planning with a focus on Wanago High School. So this is the third meeting that we have. We have one more after this. That will be a wrap-up meeting two weeks from tonight at Clarendon, uh, where we'll review everything that we've gone through. So we're going to briefly review quickly what we covered in meeting one and meeting two. So for those of you who are coming to your first meeting tonight, uh, we'll be able to take in this information here as we move forward. Uh, as we focus on the high school tonight, I'm going to get assistance from a couple of folks here on the presentation tonight. I'm looking for Dustin Lehman. Dustin Lehman, our CTE coordinator, career and technical education, uh, is, he'll speak to some of the needs that we have there. Uh, we also have uh, Mike Ganebach, who's our, one of our physical education instructors here at Bonago High School, who does a lot of work uh, straight behind us here in the fitness center. So we'll spend some time talking about that. And then we have a, a, a team, uh, teammates at Bright Architects, and Clint Selly is going to help us talk about some proposed solutions. So when we begin to consider some ideas that requires somebody who works in this day in and day out, we, we enlist the services from Bray to help find solutions for what we're, what we're looking at here. Uh, just real quickly, I want to introduce as well, for those of you who may not know, Dr. Joe Cook will be our new superintendent come July 1st. Uh, he's here to hang out for a little bit, but still has work to do in Waukesha. They have a school board meeting tonight, so uh, pardon him if he does step out. Um, he has things to do. And I also want to talk, hey, there he is. Mr. McNulty, hey, Sean, thanks for coming. Glad to have you. Um, we also have our administrative team here uh, from Mugwango High School, Jim Darren, Holly Bodish, uh, Bryn Rohde, so they might at times be able to answer some questions as we talk about the high school. So if there's questions as we move forward, this is not meant to be a lecture. Uh, we'll pause three times and ask you specific questions, which we'll look for your feedback on those handouts that we gave you, but please stop me at any point here if we have questions here. All right, so tonight we're going to roll through uh, quickly the elementary and middle school. We're going to talk about tax impacts, uh, potential sizes and scope of project and what that could mean to you. We'll review the results of the most recent project uh, uh, that we did here in 2016. And then we'll walk through the needs as we've identified them so far. I'll look for your feedback on do you agree with those needs uh, and ask questions of that nature. And then finally, we'll present some solutions and we'll go. So our background of planning, we started long range facility planning quite some time ago. So at that time, we were looking to potentially expand our career and technical education spaces. You can see some of those spaces here right now. We've had great success. You'll hear about that success. So we had the idea to potentially expand our spaces. We lost two 4K community partners, which forced two of our elementary schools to bring 4K in. And then we we're also looking for permanent locations for our SOAR program, which is an alternative setting for high school age students in our 18 to 21 year old program, which is uh, it's an educational program for students with intellectual disabilities as we prepare them to transition um, to live in a residence on their own in life skills. We'll hear about all those things. We also took a particular focus on uh, Parkview Middle School. We'll get to that next. So the goal of what we're trying to do with the study is to review, as we had just these ideas that you see here, we said, you know what, look at all the buildings, consider all the options, put everything on the table, and then we'll work with the community to say, hey, what's, what's an idea that you think we should be pursuing? Because ultimately all decisions that we make here are yours to make. All right. So the upcoming timeline that we have here, last month and this month, we're having our meeting, so we have one more after that. The school board is going to consider the feedback that you offer, okay? We'll, the school board will work to reevaluate plans and ideas here in the summer months. Uh, if there are ideas that we feel, the school board feels, that they take your feedback and feel good about certain concepts, then we'll look to do a community-wide survey in September and October. Those questions will have specific concepts with specific dollar values attached to them to see if the community would support those projects. And once we get the feedback from those uh, survey results, then the school board will have to reevaluate and decide do they want to ask the community a referendum based question. So the goal for this group right here is to help us identify issues and solutions that we have not yet considered. So if we're not mentioning something you think we should be considering, please. That's what the, the paper is in front of you for. That's what this opportunity tonight's all about. We want you to confirm the needs we think we've identified, but we'd like to hear from you and then just to get your overarching feedback. 
So as we go through some of the details that we had last time here, uh, when we begin this process, we start by looking at a capacity analysis and take a look at each of our buildings and say how much space do we have in each of our schools. So we add up the number of seats available by each classroom, whether it, you know, in the 5K classrooms, we target 22 students. At the first and second grade level, we look for uh, 24 students and, and so on and so forth. We have a certain number of seats available uh, per school board policy, and then we take a look at the number of kids enrolled and we see how much room do we have. So you can see our elementary schools, Big Ben, for example, has 32, uh, they're under capacity by 32 seats. So there are no classroom spaces at Big Ben Elementary that are unused or unutilized. We're using every space that we have, hallways, vestibules, you name it, uh, closets converted into small office spaces for one-on-one uh, -on -one interventions and things of that nature. Once Big Ben Elementary, if they were to add 32 students, that would mean every seat in every classroom is taken up. So think of it like a restaurant, Right now, there, there's a table of four, but there's only three people there. So there might be capacity for one, and every table might be taken. You might have a seat here and there available, but there's no open seats. There's no open tables, I should say. So our elementary schools have various uh, degrees of capacity that they're getting. You can see uh, Eagleville has room for nine. Prairie View has room for 42. Our elementaries are getting close to being at capacity. You really want to consider your options before you get to capacity. So that's why we're trying to address this now. Uh, the middle school and high school, you can see there's ample room at both of those buildings. Now we'll talk about moving sixth grade to the middle school, and if we were to do that, that would bring 350 students to Parkview Middle School, which would immediately put stress on that building in a way that it couldn't manage that. So we do have some, uh, we're getting close to having issues at our elementary schools. We did a long range facility study here, excuse me, a long-range population study and enrollment projection. We enlisted the help of an outside partner who specializes in such studies. And when we looked at all the, all the facts uh, of what they consider potential for growth, housing turnover, housing stock available, and a lot of different variables that will impact community growth and school growth, by 2035, we're projected to add about 2,000 additional housing units, which would lead, lead to 355 additional resident students living in our boundaries and attending our schools. Now that is the best estimate we can find. Is it gonna work out that way exactly? Definitely not. But that's information that we would be wise to consider. Certainly, we're not going to ignore that. So even if we have periods of small decline, in a long range sense, this is where we see this community going. So you can see there's a lot of stress potentially in 12 years time that will be in our elementary schools, a few more students in our middle school and a small decrease in the high school. So to alleviate things and to think forward, we could shift our sixth graders to a middle school and that would uh, resolve our projected elementary capacity issues. But as I said earlier, uh, a sixth grade shift would re result in immediate problems at Parkview Middle School. So as we considered the options there, we looked at a, different, a number of different options. What could we do? How could we bring sixth grade or maybe fifth and sixth grade into a middle school setting? And we ultimately, at this time, the idea that we're strongly considering the most is having a sixth through eighth grade building for 1,200 kids. We didn't want to do an east-west concept where we would be creating a ninth building in the district because that would ultimately have issues of its own where we have the, there's fixed costs that come with establishing a new building when you have a principal and a new uh, faculty, uh, transportation issues can follow. When we looked at all the issues here, as we talked about in previous meetings, we feel that this is the best solution for us. For a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade configuration, academic benefits include exposing our sixth graders to uh, uh, more of a middle school curriculum, exposing them to world language, uh, upper level mathematics, career and technical education courses that currently our seventh and eighth graders are getting, but our sixth graders are not. Our sixth graders are foregoing recess so they can participate in orchestra and band type courses. Uh, and that's asking a lot for a, for a young person to, to give up recess. We know how much they like that. If we got them into a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade configuration, the opportunities would, would blossom. Same thing with extracurricular and athletic opportunities. We would be able to help our, our young people in the sixth grade have more opportunities. So some of the options we've looked at here is expanding, uh, renovating parts of Parkview Middle School and expanding as well. So the yellow areas are expansion. You can see this is a rendering of what it would look like if we were to expand it. All right, so we're adding uh, 180,000 square feet for a total of 287,000 square feet. 
Uh, the pink areas, again, are renovated, so there'll be a lot of renovation that would make this building light new, okay? And the obviously the yellow areas would be brand new. There's a second floor component to this here. Uh, I'll just quickly point out a couple details. We would really focus on our sixth graders being in this part of the building. Uh, and our eighth graders would be, excuse me, our seventh graders would be on the second floor here. Our eighth graders would be below the eighth. So ideally we'd have them housed in similar uh, settings where, uh, you know, sixth grade math teachers would therefore all be able to work near each other. And those things just make sense socially for the kids and organizationally for the uh, staff. We also took a look at just a concept on paper as to what a new building might require. So we went through the math of the necessary spaces for all the subject areas that we would be teaching, the number of classrooms needed, and worked through all the mathematics to figure out how big of a building would we need for a school that would accommodate between 12 and 1300 students. And so we have a price take on that of 111 million. So we haven't gone through drawings in that step yet, but if we hear from the community, this is an idea worth pursuing, then we'll start that work, okay? Conceptually, this building could fit on the existing Parkview Middle School lot, but we are exploring other options in the community that are somewhat close uh, to the radius that we're here at Highway 83 and NN. So we're, we're taking a look at those details. The site and location would be uh, to be determined, but uh, we could work within the property that we already have. Moving on to the elementary schools. So when we take a look at our elementary schools then, we looked at four scenarios of what could we, do, again, this imagination process of what could we do with our elementary buildings here. We went through four different scenarios, all that have four different price tags. The all-in option here is really putting everything into an elementary that it could need to make sure that you have enough meeting space, collaboration space, breakout spaces for small group interventions, uh, flexible spaces for special education classrooms here, uh, additional flexible spaces for when you have that extra fourth grade uh, class when you're used to, uh, used to having just three. Give yourself the, the opportunities to always be able to accommodate whatever might come your way and to give all the professionals that educate our students in terms of those specialists that are occupational ther therapists, physical therapists, interventionists, speech language pathologists. There's a lot of people that do a lot of different things in our buildings and they do need spaces to work as simple as that. So the all-in option there uh, really creates as many solutions as possible for each of our six elementary schools. We'll go through an example of Big Ben Elementary. The reduced scope option is basically looking at the same stuff, which is on a much lesser scale and pulling some things off of the table. So in the, in the all-in option for our elementary schools that have a gym that also services as a cafeteria, the all-in option will provide a separate gym from the cafeteria for the schools that don't have it. But the reduced school option starts to pull back on that. The limited modifications option that we have, that is not going to have any expansion and very minimal renovation. So just to really accommodate each building with at least two 4K classrooms. All these ideas are considering sixth grade going out and 4K coming in to all of our buildings. All right? And then our principals did go through the legwork of no modifications to say, hey, if you had no dollars, no budget whatsoever, could you make it work with 4K students coming in? The answer to that is yes, but it's not preferred. All right, so the all-in concept, quickly going through Big Ben Elementary here. The yellow areas, again, are new are expansion areas. So we're adding uh, 25,000 square feet. You can see where there's uh, the detail on there. It's a little hard to see, but you get the idea here. The pink areas are going to be renovations to bring in three 4K classrooms. The estimated price tag on this particular renovation in addition is $17.1 million. That's the estimation right now. If we did the all-in uh, option in every building, and you can see they have various price tags, the range of those projects would be between $79 million and $90 million. So to reduce that scope a little bit, here we say, all right, let's just pull back. As I said earlier, let's reduce the scope of things we're considering. So now we're just looking at adding 3,700 square feet where we're simply putting in a 4K classroom, a special ed uh, flex classroom, and renovating some other classrooms to make sure we have three 4K and three 5K, 5K classrooms. The price tag on that is much less for Big Ben Elementary. It went from what it was to 4.7 million, and this reduced scope option brings down that what we're doing uh, down considerably and the price tag comes with it. 
In this option here, we are still getting edu uh, special education space for all of our buildings and, and dedicated the certain areas that we are interested in, such as providing educational interventions, we're providing that in the buildings, but not everything that the all-in option provided. This option is going to, as I said earlier, provide three 4K and 5K classrooms, but appropriately sized classrooms. The average size classroom for an older student is going to be about 900 square feet. But for the younger students, that's really going to be in the range of 1,200 square feet. There's a lot of times where youngins are going to gather around the teacher as a book gets read to them and they get out into that, that uh, crawl out, that walkout space there. That's not what it's called. What's that called, Stephanie? Breakout. Breakout space there. Thank you. So that there's a need for more square footage in a young classroom for 4K and 5K students. This vision that we have here for the reduced scope option would provide, would in the future, if an all in option were ever pursued, would still fit into that and not get in the way. The limited modifications, as you can see here, we're simply just taking three classrooms and getting them uh, into two classrooms that are a little bit bigger with bathrooms. So it's simply to give this option here is to give every building, every elementary building, the space for two 4K classrooms. Okay, so we're just going as limited as we have to, to to do the bare basics of bringing at least two 4K classrooms in. So the price tag here at Big Bend Elementary is now up to six hundred eighty thousand. The limited modification concepts add up for all six of our buildings to just under five million dollars. Okay. So that's a quick review of what we've covered to date. So now let's move forward here. I know there was a lot of questions and interest just about tax impact. All right, so we're gonna start walking through that. I want to basically get your, I, your, I want to clarify your understanding of what an operating tax levy is and what a referendum tax levy is. Those are two separate things that get added up and come onto your property tax bill. So I'm gonna do my best to explain both of those as clearly as I can. We're going to start with the operating tax levy. Every school district gets a certain number of dollars to provide general education, to turn on the lights, to buy textbooks and pencils, and to pay their teachers and faculty. Every school district has a different amount. This past year, we want to go at $10,016. We take that amount that we have, we multiply it by the third Friday count of students attending, resident students attending our district, and that becomes our operating budget. So you can see we have a $46.6 million operating budget. That represents about 85% of all of our dollars. And you can see Franklin and New Berlin, just for comparison purposes, since they're local districts nearby us and in the same labor market, we compete with them at times for teachers. Both have more money per student, but about 300 less students than we do. Both districts, despite being smaller, get about 3.3 .3 to $3.6 million more than us. We have a small operating budget. This has been the case here, so as there's a $3 million gap in funding, it's not just relevant to this year, it's been our story for 30 years. When we started the revenue limit laws that limit the amount of revenue that a school district can receive per pupil, when this started in a Waukesha County staff shop, we're the district on the far left at $5,320. It creates for a low tax levy, but on the flip side of that, it creates for a low investment in students. Each and every year, uh, every two years, our state government provides an increase through the biennial budget. So fast forward 30 years later, and we are second from the bottom here. So at $10,016, just $16 north of the state required minimum of $10,000. So as again, we back into that revenue limit math that I just talked about. We take our value, we multiply it by the number of students in our district. We have a $46 million operating budget. So when we that levy, that, excuse me, that form of funding is going to ultimately say we are going to get $46.6 million. That's our revenue limit. That's the limit we can collect from the tax when they give us what's known as general aid. And then the rest will come from our property tax payers. So this past year, if we had $46.6 million to work with, state government said we will give you $25.3 million, Maguanago. The rest will come from your tax payers. So that gives a $21.3 million property tax levy. We're gonna come back to that number a couple times. So our operating tax levy is there. That is a low operating tax levy for the reasons I described earlier. That pays for general education, special education, and basic building needs. There's not enough money in there to do all the things we're considering tonight. There's just no way we could set money aside and save up 
to do a, a $85 million expansion at Parkview Middle School. So the community always has an option to do a referendum, and if the community supports it, it can be pursued. This past year, we levied $9.5 million towards our referendum debt. So that money there can only be used once it's levied to pay off debt that's associated with the project, such as paying off the work that was done here at Guanajuato High School. We couldn't take that money and, and use it to pay teachers or to do anything else other than pay debt. That's the only thing that we can do with it. So the way we can compare our tax levies, our tax amount relative to the property value available to pay that $31 million that our tax levy ultimately becomes is to look at the mill rate. The mill rate compares how much money your, the, a community is being taxed relative to the property values available to pay it. In McGuanagall, we have a $6.53 mill rate this past year. So for $1,000 of a house's property value, there's a $6.53 uh, tax bill that comes with it to pay for the K-12 schools in that district. So we are in the bottom 20% of all K-12 school districts in southeastern Wisconsin. If hypothetically we didn't have any referendum debt to pay, our mill rate would be the bottom and we'd be dead bottom by 25% lower than Palmyra Eagle. So our, this highlights our operating levy. This is how low our operating levy is. Okay, again, we have an operating referendum, oh, excuse me, an operating tax levy, which you see on the left, and a referendum levy on the right. So I'm gonna walk through potential tax impacts. So as we talk about these projects here, you just wanna say, how much does this cost? What can we afford? What would we support? We're gonna go through that right now. Our school board has had a philosophy over the last three or four years to reduce taxes, the overall levy, by 0.2% each year. So there's always gonna be, a, we aim for a slight decrease which provides stability in your property tax bills each and every year. Now there's a few entities that show up on your property tax bill. I live in the town of Guanago, so I'll pay a tax that goes to the school district here, to the town of Guanago Municipal uh, um, government that funds the police and fire department there. There will also be a Waukesha County Technical College tax on there and a Waukesha County tax on there. We, the school, excuse me, the school district is going to account for about 70% of a, of a given tax bill, give or take. Sometimes tax bills can go up or down, but you have to look at what entity is responsible for that. It's not always the school district or the municipality. For the part that we can control, we aim to have a 0.2% decrease to create stability in your K-12 tax bill. Going back to last school year, a 0.2% decrease is a $31 million tax levy. We have a tax levy to pay for our school. We have two school resource officers. Uh, school district has the ability to influence that tax levy how they see fit. So we have two school resource officers. The operating tax levy in 21-22 was $24 million. That's a product of how much aid does the state give us because the rest becomes the operating tax levy. The remainder gets filled in for the referendum levy. And when you add that up, that's $31 million. Move forward to the current school year, we drop it again by 0.2%. We start with our school resource officer levy, our operating levy went down, and therefore our referendum levy can go up to prepay those debts as best we can. As we plan ahead to 23-24, we'll drop it again by 0.2%. At least that's the strategy at this time. We have our school resource officers on there. I'm projecting there will be an operating levy of $22.9 million. That will be influenced by the state biannual budget and a number of factors. The more money that our state government puts into general school aids, as general aids go up and the state pays a greater share, then our operating levy can go down. But if this math plays out this way, then we'll have an operating levy of about $8 million. The strategy I'm going to bring to you tonight for paying off any potential referendum that we would be considering is to fix this as our baseline year and to carry that number forward. So if we say that there is no tax increase, what we're saying is, is that the referendum levy amount, once we set it this fall, we're going to keep that thing flat and out to the future. So as we look ahead, we just keep that number going. Each and every year, think of it like a house payment or a car payment. You make that monthly payment, and then you just you keep that amount. 
Now the overall tax levy can go up or down at times because the operating levy can go up or down. We're just gonna focus on the referendum levy here for simplicity purposes. All right, we're gonna bring, so this is the expected value, but to give you round numbers, we'll present three options here. Okay, so we have a referendum levy of 7 million, 8 million, and 9 million. So they keep it very even. So if state, if the operating levy were to be 23.8 in this scenario, we could levy 7 million this fall. If the operating went down by a million, we could move this up by a million, so on and so forth. Does this make sense so far? Ryan, am I making sense, Ryan? Good, yeah, thanks. So if we were to have say we are going to fix our future that once we establish the baseline debt of this year at 7 million, 8 million, or 9 million based on how the state budget plays out and we identify our operating tax levy, if we had a referendum tax levy of 7, 8, or 9 million, we could finance projects in the scope of 76.1 million if we have a $7 million tax levy, a $7 million tax levy this fall and into the future for 20 more years. If we have an $8 million tax levy this fall and we sustain that into the future, we could do $89.5 million. And if we had a $9 million referendum tax levy this fall and we sustain that for 20 years thereafter, we could do $103 million worth of work without raising the referendum property tax. So there is an interesting opportunity at this time given this information. If you're doing math, uh, uh, and, you know, everyone's gonna probably ask themselves, just like I did, well, what would this mean to me? If we add $5 million of increments onto any one of these values that you see here, so if we wanna add $5 million to 103 million, it would add nine cents to the mill rate. In other words, it'll add $9 for $1,000, $100,000 of your house's value, okay? So as a hypothetical, I picked a value of $400,000 for houses. The housing market is just a little bit different right now, so values are pretty high everywhere. If we did an $8 million levy this year at no tax increase, we could do $89.5 million of work. If we were to add $5 million to that, because that's what the community ultimately is speaking to and supporting whatever those projects might ultimately entail, then we would ultimately add for a house of $400,000, it's $9 per $100,000 of a house's value. So a house of $400,000, if we were to add $5 million worth of work, would have a $36 increase to the referendum tax level. All right? This feels like a lecture. It's not supposed to be a lecture. So I apologize if it feels that way. I'm trying my best, guys. All right. So again, just to reiterate, this is what our math is currently in this community for the school district at this time. All right. What I want the uh, what I want this room to know and what I want this community to understand as we talk about this material right now is that there's two things going on that the community would want to support. One is that we sustain a seven, eight, or nine million dollar tax levy once we begin it this fall for another 20 years. So at some point, our taxes would fall off. If we don't do any other referendum work of any sort, our taxes will fall off starting in 2026 and quite significantly then in 2027. So that would be coming. What we're asking the community is, do you support your current level of taxation? And if so, to what amount? Furthermore, right now we are prepaying debt and prepaying debt, and that's what you see in the blue we would convert our prepayments into attacking the new debt that we would be taking on. So those are the two things to keep in mind. Give me some head nods, does that make sense? All right, good. All right, if we were to go beyond a no tax increase, if we identified projects and the community was very supportive of certain concepts that you'll hear shortly here, and just hypothetically, if we identified $130 million of projects that the community said, these are valuable to us. As we set our district up for the next 30 years, we believe in doing it right, uh, uh, doing things once and doing things right. And if that added up to $130 million for taxes on a house of $400,000, if we had a $7 million tax levy this fall, but wanted to do $130 million of work, taxes for that house would go up $388 annually. 
if we have an $8 million levy this year, and we decide to do $130 million of work, that tax increase for referendum debt would be 291. If we have a $9 million tax levy, the bigger base to begin from, and we decide to do $130 million of work, that would be $194, 194 additional dollars on the tax levy. All right, so the potential impacts, as I wrap this up, we're gonna ask you a question on the next slide. What we need to answer here is, what will this year's operating tax levy be? Because once we know that, then we can understand our, 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 our magnitude of what the referendum tax levy can be. We aim to reduce the overall tax levy by 0.2% for reasons I discussed earlier. So this will determine ultimately what we can levy without an increase to taxes. Again, every five, every $5 million of any project we'll consider here shortly would uh, increase the mill rate by nine cents or $9 per $100,000 of a house's value. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick break here. That's enough talking by me. We're gonna ask you guys at your tables then to go on to the sheets that you have as we go into breakout session one. First thing I'll ask is, before we turn it over here, is do you have questions about the potential tax impacts? Yes. So we have a we have a, a, an agreement with the uh, Guanaco Police Department. We have Chief, uh, Chief Street here right now. We pay 65 percent of the of the cost of that school resource officer, and then 35 percent is paid by the police uh, the Guanaco Police Department because obviously the school resource officers, when it's June, July, and August, aren't working here. They're back out uh, doing what they normally would do. So. We might have to adjust that upwards at times, but we have a little bit of cushion to account for, you know, growing salaries of Officer Steinbrenner and Officer Pettit. Other questions? All right, so I'm, I'll walk around here. We're gonna turn over to you guys to talk for four or five minutes at your tables. Just, we, we would like for you to write on your paper and give us feedback, what questions you might have, and do you support this financing strategy? So at the end of this, we'll collect your papers and it'll be good feedback that if you could offer anything about this, we'll take that feedback into consideration. So we'll give you five minutes to do that. All right, we're gonna move forward here right now. If you have other questions about that, I will be here to talk to you about those here. But we're gonna, uh, in the interest of time, keep moving forward here right now. We're gonna walk through uh, the success of the project at Maguanago High School that when we did this project in 2016. And we have good problems now um, because of some of the things you see students in there right now, part of our robotics team. You're gonna hear from Dustin Lehman talk about the impact that the work did on kids and learning and how there's a higher demand for certain things. So we'll talk about uh, what, our, what we view our needs as. I'm gonna to go to a quick video here from uh, Dustin Lehman and our principal Jim Darren. So here we go. Hi, I'm Jim Darren, principal at McGuanago High School. And I'm Dustin Lehman, coordinator of college career readiness for the McGuanago Area School District. Jim and I are gonna take you on a quick tour of McGuanago High School. After renovations were complete in 2018, McGuanago High School became the centerpiece of not only the entire school district, but also the community. One of our areas of renovation was our Career and Technical Education Areas, or CTE. These renovations have provided tremendous opportunities for all of our students. Since the renovation, student enrollment in CTE classes has increased by 252% and more than 42% of MHS graduates are leaving with an industry recognized credential, which allows students to demonstrate mastery of in-demand skills that are necessary for success in today's workforce. Two concerns remain with our CTE facilities. In the renovation, not all areas were modernized. For example, our automotive technician shop remains outdated and undersized. To accommodate our students and the quickly changing technology, a new automotive shop is needed. Second, in areas that were renovated, 
Demand by students and families for CD courses exceeds our capacity to serve them. Spaces like the Fork in the Road Culinary Classroom and the IDC Industrial Technology Center host full classes throughout the day. High school groups like our successful FIRST Robotics Team 930 do not have space to practice and prepare for their competitions. And in the case of Team 930, the district rents off-site facilities to provide needed room for their equipment and preparations. Further expansion of these areas and spaces to support our growing construction, building trades, culinary arts, and other CTE programs is needed to allow further growth. The renovated spaces at MHS are popular with community groups and other school events as well. Since the renovation, the Greenwald Foundation Performing Arts Center has become a year-round attraction for concerts, musicals, plays, recitals, and other community events. The Fork in the Road Culinary Classroom and other renovated spaces are used by the MASD Community Education Program, our district's very popular summer school program, and much more. There are additional needs that were not addressed in the last renovation. For example, MHS currently hosts an alternative high school program at an off-site location. We also provide an 18 to 21 year old education program for students with special needs, teaching them skills to work and live independently after graduation. The current high school does not have the facilities to support these important programs. A consideration for any future renovation is how we can incorporate spaces for alternate programs to help our students transition to life after high school. Beyond academics, McGuanago has a proud athletic history both in the schools and around the community. Since the renovation, McGuanago High School's three gyms and fitness center are used all the time. The turf cell gym is used by district athletic teams throughout the fall, winter, and spring months when weather conditions keep teams from practicing outdoors and is frequently requested by outside groups. The North Gym and the New West Gym are booked to capacity by district teams and outside groups. The demand for the use of these spaces is far greater than our ability to serve them. Additional athletic spaces would allow MASD to further support district athletics and provide greater opportunities for the community groups to access high quality facilities. Every district's high school is both the front porch and the backyard of the community. McGuanago Area School District residents should be extremely proud of the fantastic high school facilities we currently have and the opportunities they provide to district students and residents. As the district considers next steps in the recent facility study, we look forward to how McGuanago High School will continue to support students to graduate college and career ready and provide opportunities for all our district residents. All right, so let's just walk through some of the spaces here that we saw in the video. All right, so one of the major pieces of the cornerstone kind of linchpin, so to speak, of the project in 2016 was to address the cafeteria, the commons that we're in right now. Because of the reduced size of the commons, it created a problem in scheduling. We can only get so many students that get served and to eat food in an adequate amount of time that it forced scheduling issues, believe it or not, that our students can only take seven classes in a semester. Most school districts, in fact, all in Waukesha County will have eight offerings. So you can see how crowded the cafeteria used to be. Uh, there's no students in this picture, but you can see the space that we have right now. This space worked for our students. It allowed for uh, expansion uh, of from seven to eight courses in a semester. And so that's more academic opportunities for all of our kids, which benefits all kids who eventually come through this school. The Commons is a highly utilized area, not just for a school, but for purposes like this, for the community to gather. Uh, here we have a picture of the Monaco Grizzlies wrestling program. Mr. Scobiak, how many people do we have at that? So that's a good example of how this space is used by the community. It's an asset to all who live here. We worked on our PAC at that time here. You can see pictures of our old PAC had capacity for just under 400. Sean, is that correct? It was just about 400, is that? Under 400. So you can see how tight now, I think Sean's actually speaking in this, so every chair is taken up. People want to hear what Sean has to say. All right, but now we have a new PAC here. Okay, we've had 355 events that are including rehearsals, practices, and live events. 
You can see it's not just MHS kids, it's Parkview Middle School kids, it's our elementary students. The community uses it. I believe Grace Notes Orchestra has an upcoming concert. Again, it's another asset of the community. We look to address our common classroom spaces here. You can see on the left-hand side, that's a tight classroom. When you're putting 25 or 28 kids into a, a general classroom, that's bumper to bumper. We have the opportunity there on the right-hand side, you can see we have more open spaces. We can accommodate more students in certain classes if there's high demand without packing everybody in there. So we address our classrooms. On the left, you can see the band and music spaces, low ceilings, everybody's tight. Uh, if you're sitting in front of the dude with the trombone, you'll, you'll feel it. On the right-hand side, we lifted the ceilings. It's better acoustic sounds. It's better all around. Again, a lot of community groups use our music rooms. We have the West Gym as a part of this project here. The West Gym not only serves as a hub for our basketball games and a lot of competitions, but it's hosted a lot of neutral site events here. So the WIA has used us here. This past year, we hosted uh, sectional semifinals for both boys and girls. Unfortunately, our teams didn't make it, but we hosted outside communities to come and use our gym space, which brought in 800 spectators. Last year, when we hosted the sectional finals, over 1,900 fans attended from Racine and Waukesha to watch their teams do battle, and we had to shut the doors. We, we couldn't accommodate more. There was capacity of 2,000, but it, it was standing room only, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Those, those events are bringing in people from around the commu other communities into ours. It, it guarantees it packs our, impacts our gas stations, our restaurants, um, Culver's, you name it. It, it. That's good for the community. We've hosted regionals, for wrestling sectionals, as well as conference tournaments. On the left-hand side, you can see a picture of when we hosted the UW Badgers Women's uh, National Championship volleyball team against Marquette, and that's a packed gym. On the far right-hand side, there's the sectional finals that I have referenced from last year. And you can see people off to the right-hand side, they're packed in there as well. Again, it's an asset to the community in many, many ways, and it benefits a lot of people. So in other words, we think that the project worked. Summer school here, you can see we have an upward trend in summer school. Because of the size of the space that we have here, we moved our summer school operations, rather than having some at the middle school or some at the high school and some at El Clarendon Elementary School, we said let's bring it all to one building. So we brought it to Guanajuato High School, and that bar chart speaks for itself in terms of how many kids are continuing to take summer courses once they get out. They love school so much in Guanajuato that they come back in June and July. It's unbelievable. So now we're going to start talking about career technical education courses, so I'm going to hand it to Dustin. All right, thank you, Tom. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Dustin Lehman. I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those that don't know me, you saw the video. I am the College Career Readiness Coordinator for the school district, so I get to, I have the benefit and privilege of being in all of our buildings, uh, whether it be STEM at the elementaries or our CTE and STEM class at Parkview, as well as Obviously, the majority of the work that you see here at the high school with all of our CT classes that we'll talk about tonight. Um, many familiar faces in here. It's great to see a lot of businesses and a lot of other uh, parents that I see in the community. You can probably imagine how awkward it was for me to see my face on that video and how many takes that probably took to get. So um, I apologize for that. But as you can see, this bar chart here, um, our, we have had steady growth in our CT numbers. We've grown over, by over 250%. Um, since 2017-18 with this referendum project that we've been able to do. And numbers are still preliminary, we're still kind of working those out, but for this year, uh, we're somewhere in the range of 4,700 requests right now for CT. So for a sixth straight year, it has grown again. 42% um, of our graduates, so that's um, just under 200 students are bringing in industry-recognized certification, so we are very proud of that because not only does that have, gives those students something to take with them when they leave here, um, but it also brings in a lot of funding for our programs to continue to build into uh, the curriculum and the supplies and materials for our students. And then we have over 180 students uh, right now working in a some sort of a work-based learning experience, whether that be a youth apprenticeship. I know ICT from Fork in the Road here, we have multiple students working there. We have multiple students working at Mad Glouche with IDC. You can see the branding on our, our facility here with Kevin King at BGS. Uh, we see 
Lynch here, we have multiple students there, so we have a lot of opportunity getting those kids out there because we have over 300 jobs available in the area right now on our job board. The work that we're doing here is important. So looking at our CT lab usage, with this growth, we have uh, some limitations. We, we have grown significantly, that is great. However, we have some challenges because of that growth. Again, those are good problems, but as we look at our construction and our building trades, when we look at those facilities, we have an eight period day. We can only use those labs for eight uh, scheduled classes. We use them all eight. We experimented in 2021 trying to do nine out of eight, so we overbooked the lab, but with other growth in other areas, we're just no longer able to do that. In automotive, we are using it all eight periods of the day. In our hospitality and culinary arts, we use 12 out of eight sections. So what that means is we are double booked and we rotate different teachers going in there to use those lab spaces. Now you'll see that this is full to capacity and on this next slide you'll see in these different pathways how many students we're turning away right now. Although we're booking them solid, we are still turning away a lot of our students. So with our building trades, um, with our pathway in 2019, you can see the number of requests. So that's how many students are wanting to sign up for these classes. Our enrollments are how many students we were able to accommodate. And then you can see how many students we, we have had to turn away in those programs. So this isn't in 2018-19 when you have new spaces, you have new curriculum. There's a lot of opportunity because you have four grade levels that can now take brand new classes. That never slowed down even though every year um, we've had those kids take those classes, we've had more and more interest. When we look at our automotive pathway, again, we're eight out of eight out of the day and every year we are turning away kids. And then in our hospitality, look at those numbers. It is absolutely crazy the amount of students that uh, sign up for these classes. However, we have to turn away just because we can't accommodate that because of our lab space. So if we look at, uh, we have roughly 24 students in a lab-based class. For construction and building trades, we're turning away roughly five sections of classes. In automotive, roughly two sections. In the hospitality and culinary arts, we're turning away over nine sections of uh, students every year. So to kind of put that towards our labor market data, um, over the next, over this decade right here, construction, building trades, as many of you in here know, obviously is booming right now with a 7.5% increase, so that's definitely an area we want to continue to support. With automotive, there's a projected to be a 5% increase, and with hospitality and culinary arts, we're projected to be over a 22% increase. So these are areas that we want to continue to support for our students. So I don't know if many of you know about our robotics team. Our robotics team is ranked ninth in the world right now. They're, the, they're in the top eight in the nation. They just finished down in Houston at the World Championships, and they're here right now. They're still working. So while their season has just wrapped up, they still continue to put the work in. Um, and it is crazy to me, I see seniors over there. Their season is done, and they are still working, even though they are, most of these seniors are checked out by now, right? So, not our students. So we, part of their success is we have brought them into our school district. Since we brought them in, they have had obviously a lot of success, but with growth in all of these areas, we no longer are able to support their team inside of our building. So much like our musical needs the PAC to perform and to practice, or our football team needs the football field to perform and practice, our robotics team needs a space to practice. They still come in here, obviously as you can see, to utilize our spaces, our equipment, um, that has been a huge help for them, but now we are needing to rent outside space in our industrial park to um, support their growth and their demand. So as you can see, we have students here now, and I'm sure we have students down in the industrial park as well, utilizing that space right now. So, any questions regarding our CTE spaces, our growth, and what we have to do with trying to accommodate them in their lab spaces? Before I turn it over to Mike Neva, yes. <coughs> So our space is staying the same, however, we have put teachers on overloads. Um, it's not ideal. 
but teachers are going on overload to try to accommodate because every teacher in our building with these electives, their goal is to grow their program. They are very proud of it. They do an amazing job. With growth requires more teaching power. And they volunteer to take on those overloads. And that's how we're able to continue to accommodate max eight out of eight. Um, so a teacher's load is six out of eight. So we have more than one teacher either teaching out of that lab or we have teachers going above and beyond and teaching on an overload schedule. All right, so without further ado, our varsity football coach and our PE teacher, Mike Neva. Thank you, Dustin. So I'm here to talk about our, our fitness center, which is directly behind you. I don't think it is far-fetched for me to say that it is the most utilized classroom or room in the entire school district. It is used 12 months out of the year uh, between our summer school classes and obviously our classes throughout uh, the school year. And as you can see up here, the space is utilized 18 out of 8 blocks every single day. So what does that mean? It means that there are at least two classes going on in there every single day block that is offered, and in two of those blocks, three classes are going on simultaneously in that room. Uh, the picture on the screen is an after school, middle school, and youth weights program that, that goes on also, and that starts in December, and it goes through the month of May. And then we pick up our Indian Athletic Performance class in summertime, which rolls through the months of June and July. So. Uh, as far as stress, uh, that room is stressed out more than, uh, in my opinion, any other room in the entire school district. So, as it says there, 200% utilization with that space, and uh, we we have uh, we're we're busting at the seams in that room. Uh, once I get to the next slide here, you'll see that I, I jumped to this one. It's somewhere up here. I'll go back. But we'll, we'll just stick with, with, with this right here. So currently there are 771 students, which is about 50% of our population, that are enrolled in classes during the school year. Um, that, that makes sense. If you do the math, uh, there are certain classes where there are over 70 students in there. Uh, and then there are other classes. So like my average class size is, is roughly 35. And that's with some of them being a little smaller because it's being utilized by two other teachers and myself at the same time. So uh, we are in need of a bigger space in, in order to accommodate all of our, all of our students. Uh, as you can see here, uh, it, it does. Uh, so we have 50% of all our freshmen take some sort of class in the fitness center, and then it drops. And, and uh, the, the reason behind it, it dropping is because, well, FIAD credits get fulfilled. And then as students grow and get older, there are more AP offerings. And the, like our Project Lead the Way classes also uh, are offered. Uh, and then, you know, all the, the CTE classes as well. So that's why, why the numbers drop. But we still have, you know, a significant number of students that are enrolled in our physical education courses. Uh, here are just a few pictures of you know, what it looks like uh, during class or after school when we are offering uh, our youth weights programs. So, you know, what right now that current space is about 5,500 square feet. Uh, we're thinking, you know, 10,000 square feet would be able to better accommodate our students, especially if it were, you know, more uh, fitness equipment and less things that plug in. Uh, the th things that plug in like treadmills, ellipticals, take up a significant amount of space. So, within the last five years, two school districts in the state of Wisconsin have just built 10,000 square foot facilities. Uh, Bayport High School, which is in the Howard Swamico district next to Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, they just built uh, a 10,000 square foot space that utilizes 40 racks. It's state of the art. And, you know, something that, you know, if we were able to, to build something new, we would definitely model it. Uh, you know, after Bayport or Kimberly High School on the north side of Lake Winnebago uh, did the same thing. They built a 10,000 square foot weight room, again with 40 racks. And if, if we were able to do something like that, we would be able to take our classes from right now. We can currently, you know, 75 is really bursting 
at the scenes, but we have 90 in there in one class, 90 kids, which gets really, really, really congested and almost becomes a safety issue. Uh, we, you'd easily be able to take 120 kids and, and, it would be able, and, and it would be safe. You'd only have three kids per rack. And, uh, you know, I, I think the learning environment would be just that much better. So, um, with that being said, you know, Tom asked me to just to come and, and talk about the current space right now. And we are in need of, uh, of a larger space and, and a bigger facility. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to carry on here. I have just a quick snapshot. We, we looked at Kimberly, we looked at Bayport here. Um, this is an example of a project that's taking place directly to the east of us. Um, uh, Muskego has uh, currently entertained the same time, I shouldn't say entertained. They've moved forward with this project here, so you can see um, they are moving towards a new weight facility there. That's 10,000 square feet. And then they also have a, uh, a multi purpose indoor facility, which will kind of be my segue here for the next piece of this here. So, one project that we did as part of the 2016 referendum is that we took the South Gym and we put turf in it. It previously had rubber floors in there, so it was traditionally used you know, for typical purposes like basketball, volleyball, etc. Um, but we had a, a good idea there to put turf in that, which allows for a, a number of different types of, uh, type of athletic activities to take place. This facility right now, uh, similar to our fitness center, is heavily, heavily utilized not only by students, but also by the community. When we get into November, December, uh, January, winter months, wet months in the springtime, the South Gym is booked seven days a week till 9 p.m. On weekends, there is no availability between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. A number of outside groups will use that, uh, in addition to our varsity sports teams that use that. Uh, community organizations, uh, Maguango Tribe, Maguango Braves, lacrosse programs, uh, SC43, which is a soccer organization that serves kids, uh, cheer, dance, softball, you name it, it's used and it's booked. So there are some limits on what can be done in this facility just based on the size of it. So it's 25 yards wide, uh, long, uh, but it has some obviously some space constra uh, constraints. Prior to the South Gym having turf in it, you can see a picture here of kids playing soccer in the off season at Parkview Middle School. Clearly not ideal or realistic. On the right hand side, you can see they can get a little bit of a better, not even a little bit of a better opportunity, a much better opportunity that that project provided. In terms of utilization there, in the 2022 calendar year, that gym was used for over 1,600 hours. Uh, by community groups, varsity sports, our band, private groups, and even academic, uh, certain academic uh, uh, initiatives took place in there. Through April 30th of this year, so it was just uh, as of very, very recently, we're up to 784 hours. Uh, we will probably eclipse that 1600 hours, I would imagine, again, by community groups, sports programs, and academics. 500 hours are already booked as we look in May through June. So there are a number of community groups that line up and are asking uh, Mr. Trudell there, our athletic director, can I get space? And are we able to accommodate Andy? I could fill two groups this size uh, until 10 o'clock every night from November 1st until April 1st. So there is a great demand on this particular facility. The village of Aguanico um, and, and, and the village board government issued a, they have a comprehensive outdoor recreation plan that they update every five to eight years. As a part of this plan, they issued a survey to the community to gather citizen feedback on what they would like their recreation opportunities to be. So 795 individuals responded to this survey. Some of them lived, most of them lived in the village of McGuanago, with others from other municipalities such as the town of McGuanago or the village of Big Ben. The village obviously kind of serves as a hub in many, many ways, geographically speaking, to our school district. So outsiders that live outside of the village of Guanago also took the survey. When respondents were asked which amenities should be added, improved, or expanded in the village, the top responses included amongst village residents, they said number one, lake and shoreline restoration, two, indoor athletic complex, and three, snowmobile trails. Uh, all other respondents, so those outside the village proper boundaries, replied one, outdoor pool slash splash pad, two, bakes, 
excuse me, beach slash lake access, and three indoor athletic complex. The number of answers that were provided, unique, different ideas, you know, was 30 or 40 ideas. So when these two and both sets, subsets of uh, respondents emerged, you can see that there's clearly interest from the larger community. To draw, you'll see that throughout the state now there is a growing trend of school districts building indoor facilities. Uh, as far north as Rhinelander, Wisconsin, and we'll take a look at them. DC Everest is the letter E. In our area, we have Elkhorn, Muskego, and, and Sussex, Hamilton. Uh, we have uh, Plymouth, uh, Kakana, Kimberly, West of Pier, and Southern Door are examples of school districts who have taken this step and have found a lot of success by doing this. So just down I-43, just past East Troy, you'll come across Elkhorn and just north of us, uh, excuse me, uh, way north of us is Kimberly. So you can see that those uh, school districts and communities supported a multi-purpose indoor facility. Taking a look at the inside here, on the left we have Elkhorn. So Elkhorn has uh, uh, the opportunity they can drop down their nets and divide this up uh, and create four sections in one area. On the far right hand side then we have Kimberly. They did a little bit differently by putting an indoor track that allows for walking, running, to take place around the perimeter of, uh, of the facility. Up in Rhinelander, they have one of the largest freestanding domes in North America. So these are pretty common in Canada. I, you know, can it withhold this, withstand the weight of the snow? And the answer is yes. So you can just take a look as an idea of what other districts are thinking about and doing. Uh, in Rhinelander, this is much larger than those previous uh, facilities I showed you were about 60 yards plus an end zone, so call it 70 yards of space on the inside for various activities. Uh, Rhinelander has a much larger one. They have 100 yards of, of space, which allows for them to accommodate two baseball or softball games sim simultaneously, and they also have indoor uh, tennis courts here. So on the bottom right corner, you can see you got pickleballers having a game, getting after it. Uh, on the top there, you can see there's a softball tournament that's taking place there uh, during the cold uh, and wet months. So there's a lot of options here. Yes? Do people pay to rent that? That is a choice of the district. So my father-in-law happens to live in Rhinelander. He goes and he he's, tells me how proud he is that he cuts some weight during the winter months because he walks inside of there. Yeah, sure. Sure. That would become a preference. It, do you charge outside groups that use the facility? That would be a preference, really, of what would the school board like to do. Um, I talked to the gentleman that, uh, at Elkhorn with their facility. When they pitched this idea to their community, they made it known, we do not intend to charge our community groups those that have primarily Elkhorn Area School District kids, when they want to use it, we're going to be available to our students first, then to the Recreation Department, then for community groups that have an identity in Elkhorn, and then if there's space available, they'll rent it to outside private entities for a cost. But they make it available extremely cheap, almost free in most cases. I believe Sussex Hamilton does it a little bit differently. So I don't want to speak to that for certain, but it's the preference of how the school board wants to make their assets available. Obviously, if you have a high price tag, groups can't maybe access that. If the Boy Scouts want to use that, they might not be able to access it if it's expensive. So it's a balancing act. Now, I know my son who plays baseball. In the winter months, they go to the OAW facility in New Berlin on Racine Avenue, and they'll, the, the organization will put three teams or four teams in there at once at a cost of $300 an hour. That is a huge price tag, but if you go there, you will see a packed facility full of softball teams, lacrosse teams, uh, you name it, there's a lot. Um, sports and athletics gives kids something to do. It improves academic outcomes when they participate in athletics, it improves mental health. It makes everything better. It, and you'll see it when you have a space that's available, people are using that, and that is a good thing for society. Do we charge people for the green wall? We have a tiered, we have a tiered system, so if you're community-based, 
if, if it's for our if it's for our students, there's no cost. If Section Elementary is coming to sing a, a Christmas concert, we're clearly not charging them. If it's a if it's an organization that has roots in Mwangongo, there will be a small fee for that. If you're an outside group that's coming from Racine and you're a professional dance company that wants to do a show, then we charge you differently than that. But we try to be as reasonable as possible. But obviously, there are some fees we have to charge to turn lights on and to heat it or to cool it. So we, we, we review those quite frequently with the school board to make sure we're doing what's right. Same with the turf. So I think we charge $10 an hour to community groups. A similar space, like I said, OAW is worth 300 an hour. So we think we're being reasonable. Obviously, there's wear and tear, there's replacement costs. So we do have to charge something, but we feel that that's very affordable. Any other questions on this topic? OK. So just a couple more things, then we'll have a short breakout session one more time here. So baseball, softball, as we, again, talked about all the needs that we're considering here right now. We, we play spring baseball here in Wisconsin. Not quite sure why we made that decision statewide, but we did. Because it rains a lot, it snows at times, but we play spring, and, uh, spring softball and baseball. We have a natural grass field. Obviously, when it rains, that's not playable. We also don't have lights on our field here, so we have, you know, in spring months here at times, you know, the sun sets early and daylight runs out. So this is identified as a need. When you turf a softball or baseball field, there's a few different ways to do it, and I'll just highlight the Whitewater School District, for example. You can turf just the infield. You could, at times, as they've done here, add the wings with turf and leave the outfield grass, or you could do all of it. And each of them have various price tags. So as, again, as we identify needs, that's one And talking with Mr. Trudell, our athletic director, is one that if we're talking about all ideas on the table, we'll put that one out there and let the community weigh in. I'm gonna pivot now to two academic uh, areas here as we uh, talk about our 18 to 21 year old program. As I said earlier, we educate our students with intellectual disabilities uh, through the age of 21. Our, you can see some of the spaces that we have here is ideally we're gonna uh, help these kids prepare for life after school, residential living, life skills, things of that nature. It's hard to do when you're keeping them in a classroom how to function away from a classroom. So ideally doing this in a classroom setting isn't preferred. You can see uh, a particular classroom in Laguango High School and how we're using that space. Does it work? Sure. Is it best thing for those kids? No. Our goals for this program are, are giving them life-based skills. Uh, ideally, we put them in an apartment-style setting to help them foster independent living skills, cooking, cleaning, doing all those things you gotta do when you're living on your own. We also try to teach those kids career and job-based skills. So again, we're current, our current format's in a traditional classroom, and that's not ideal. Then we have our SOAR program, which is an alternative high school for students in grades 9 through 12, where Guanaco High School and the traditional setting that we find ourselves in right now just isn't really the best thing for those students. We've operated this program as an alternative for our students since the 18-19 school year. We were originally housed in the Lillian Rose Building, which as we take a look at a map of the village of Guanaco, here is the downtown village. And if we take Fox Street or County Road ES, here's Aptar and across the street, uh, it was once known as the Lillian Rose Building and now it's been sold. And when they were sold and bought by a different buyer, we were forced to vacate that building. We tried really hard to find multiple sites where we could house this, okay? And we looked everywhere throughout the village. Um, a permanent solution has really been looked since, trying to find one since 2017. Zoning and building codes are, are a little bit difficult um, in terms of making sure there's sprinklers anytime. If 20 students go into a restaurant, there doesn't need to be sprinklers. If 20 students go into the same building to learn from a textbook, there needs to be sprinklers. It's just what it is a, it's a thing we need to navigate. So we've tried to find solutions for this and they've really come up empty. Currently, we're being housed by St. James Church. We're very thankful to them for allowing for us to use some of their vacant space, but it won't be vacant much longer. We're able to keep their program there this year and next year, but after that, we must find a landing 
uh, pad a, a final destination for this particular program. So this is an alternative education program that currently operates off-site. Now we're going to pause here and turn it back over for some discussion. So on your sheets again, we have some questions that we're asking over here. So the first one, I'll just read it out loud here. As a result of the investment in curriculum enhancements in the career and tech ed portions of the 2016 project, the demand from students has exceeded the available space. Do you feel we should increase our investment in CTE to meet the increased demand? We're interested in your thoughts, and if you have particular ideas, please include those. Second question we're asking in the middle is, do you agree that the multi-purpose indoor facility, fitness center, and ball turf projects should be priorities in the master plan? Maybe some, maybe all, maybe just one, whatever it might be. We're interested in your feedback. If you have any questions about the 18 to 21 year old program or SOAR, we'll be here to answer it, but you can also write those down. And as always, we'll provide a written Q&A for any questions you ask and provide those to you later. Sure. Um, I'm going to have Christine Bowden, our Director of Pupil Services, come on up here and ask that question. Jot down your ideas, ask your questions, let us know what you're thinking. All right, guys, here we go. Home stretch time. We have a few more, we have just a few more slides here. And then I'm going to turn this over to Clint Sully from Gray Architects. He's going to talk about some of the proposed solutions that we'd like for you to consider. Next time, 65 finance slides and I get two, so we're all, we're all good. That's right, that's right. All right, so um, again, one of the, the things that sort of is happening as we're looking at a lot of these solutions for the building is, is a bit reminiscent of, of the, the previous project in 2016 and 18. Um, we essentially built an auditorium to fix uh, a cafeteria problem and that's a little bit sort of what, you know, kind of what, what, what's happening here with some of these uh, additional projects at the high school. So um, as we look at the site, kind of the, the big one is this um, indoor uh, multi-use facility. Um, it's, a, it's a very large box. It's a very large amount of space with um, uh, the, the, turf, the turfed area. And then so that, that's what's taking up this here. And then we also have the, the fitness uh, right next door to that. Um, that's, that is reminiscent kind of, of of the Kimberly project or some of those others is that fitness and indoor uh, facility kind of go hand in hand. Uh, you can have some nice large doors that open up and kind of spill out into that. So again, the, the indoor facility can be a bit even more of an extension of that fitness area. Um, again, the, the site is, there's a lot on this site currently. So our goal in doing this was to try to locate this in a spot where we didn't have to make significant changes to a lot of the work that was done previously or or affect a lot of other areas within the building. 
So again, we're, for point of reference, we're in the cafeteria up here. Uh, the new West Gym is over here. So the idea is that we would build uh, this new facility on the west side of, what is that What was that other gym referred to as? The South Gym. The South Gym, sorry, yep. So uh, again, the, the fitting it in here. Again, it will impact some parking, um, but we do believe we can recoup some of that by adding some additional um, parking along the drive that extends back beyond. Uh, another piece of this is, is that we were able to still maintain our access all the way around the building. Um, so we are able to do that. We would extend, uh, continue to extend the drive around so that we'd have that um, uh, safety access all the way around the building. And then we are also not uh, impacting the, the baseball and softball fields. So um, it would still allow them to become turf um, if, if so desired. So again, kind of from the, the massive site perspective, that's our, our major challenge there. Uh, as Tom alluded to, as we're able to build this uh, beautiful turf uh, an indoor multi-use facility, it does free up now the, the, the south gym here to be something else. So the plan right now would be to move some of the tech ed spaces, the autos, and then create some additional spaces, again, potentially for robotics and other lab space uh, within that area of the existing South Gym. Again, kind of the, the snowball pin, pinball effect here is that moving autos out of their current space would then allow um, some woods and, and metals and those types of things to move into that current auto lab space um, and, and, f and free up and create more space within that tech ed area for those for those purposes. Uh, as we look in the, the interior of the building, if we move fitness out, that does allow for um, potentially some additional classrooms uh, to be located, uh, again, within the, the heart of the school. And then we would update and increase our foods lab and culinary offerings um, within this. So that the space, I think you saw a couple pictures and, and the description of that, uh, t however they do 12 out of eight, days, eight periods a day, um, happens in this room here. And we would um, expand that and create some additional culinary spaces within that. Um, there's also just a couple rooms I didn't show the floor plan, but there are a couple rooms on the second floor that we would take, basically take three rooms that are a, a bit undersized and, and um, renovate them to two uh, nicer sized spaces. So again, on the side here, you can see kind of the tally of, of the different parts and pieces of, of all of these different items that we're, we're considering and kind of the dollar amount that uh, uh, incurred with them. And again, roughly about $28.2 million in total here for, um, for the high school. Thanks, Clint. So this is not an all or nothing you know, set of ideas. These are just all the ideas we could think of, again, as we went through an imagination process of how can we make McGuanico High School even better. These are the ideas that we came up with. So we have that information there for you. Do you guys have any questions about any of this stuff? Andrea? So the renovations, or a lot of the renovations, kind of predicate on the new construction. If the new construction were not to happen, does that mean then also that like the autos, the auto shop and the woods and stuff would not then be able to expand? Yes, yeah, so in terms of where autos currently resides, it resides in this area right here, Dustin, is that correct? The bank right here, I'm sorry. So in order to give them a bigger space if, if we'll take you on a tour if you want to take a look here, but maybe the video will demonstrate how tight it is in there. Dustin, I'm actually going to have you, can you come up here and just kind of talk about how that doubles up, I believe, for like machines, uh, engines, rather. So when these, uh, when, when these meetings were happening before our last referendum, there was a need to expand um, our arts, our fine arts. With that, we lost square footage with our autos. So now we're putting multiple programs in the one auto shop. So with that being used eight out of eight, and I apologize, I forgot to mention this when I was up here the first time. So we are running both our mechanical side of it, the maintenance, and also the small engine piece of it all in there one time. So our biggest issue right now is with 24 students in there, 
and six lifts, six vehicles to try to accommodate those that many students per vehicle to have different stations to keep them all moving through. Our, all of our vehicles have to be raised just in order to walk through the space right now. So not only are we eliminating students going in there because um, because we don't have the, the amount of time in the day, but also it's becoming a safety issue as well just because of the limited space with everything in there. Um, as we try to grow our program and grow our opportunities, I know Lynch has done an amazing job of helping donate some of that equipment in there so we can expose our students to more opportunities. We're just crunched in there and we're spilling into the hallways, just storing our things. We have storage pots out in the back parking lots just to try to accommodate. Our vehicles are pushed out into the parking lot just to try to create the space so that it's a safe environment to learn. So Andrew, I think one of the questions you had is if we took our autos area and we moved it to the South Gym, then we've displaced the South Gym. Clearly the community has shown a great uh, utilization, and not just the students, but the community of using that space. That as we move into this space for CTE purposes, we look to provide a solution that has clearly been utilized by our community. So the addition for the auto then would be moving out of here, expanding for our construction and building trades, and now our autos move into the cell gym. So I guess it would depend on where we go with that. Our buses come along this side and we wrap around and exit, and like the traffic flow of that is really critical to moving 1,600 students, um, that any addition really right here could not take place. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about here, and this is something the school district we're already moving forward with, we, we are renovating and redesigning our health plan one of the concepts we are implementing that we anticipate tremendous success with is having an on-site health clinic at Guanago High School to help control our health care costs. Those costs, as you probably are experiencing in your own personal lives, are skyrocketing. We are putting in a clinic into this area that will be available to our employees uh, and their dependents. But that kind of really speaks for this space here. So if you're looking at that like, hey, could we build out? That would kind of impede on the plans that we're currently moving forward with. Uh, we could certainly look into that, Sarah. So if we put autos in here, I think that would kind of just take away from the concentration of these courses living here. I think, in, in a sense, it, it makes... It across collaboration that currently happens with it being on opposite sides of the building. That would be a limitation. Other ideas or questions, Sarah? That's a good one. We appreciate that. Ryan. So we haven't considered that yet, but certainly that could be a consideration. So like I said earlier, Elkhorn has the identical uh, build out that you're seeing there. Um, they, they don't, the community paid for it, this is their thing, the community's paid for it, don't make them pay again to use it. Now outside groups that are coming from say, Cal Moraine or uh, our neighbors to the east, you know, then hey, we're charging you. You know, you didn't pay for this, so your outside private group that doesn't hail from here, you gotta pay. Elkhorn makes their weight room available for their law enforcement and fire department uh, personnel. They wanna make sure it's a, an asset to the community. So if a second shift or third shift a firefighter or a police officer um, wants to work out at Elkhorn's facilities, they can, and they're not charging that. It depends, and it's a function of what does the school board want to do in terms of making this available to the community. Elkhorn makes their weight room available to the community, I believe between like 4.30 and 7.30 uh, each day, as long as it doesn't compete again when uh, the varsity athletes are in there. And I believe they charge $60 a year for that purpose. Could you charge more? Probably. That would just be a decision if it gets made, what would the school board like to do? 
Yes, we have a couple of school board members right over here. You can go ask them, hey, what would you guys do? Didn't mean to put you on the spot, guys, but yes. That's a good question here. In terms of this year, you should have came to our meeting on Monday night or here recently in April. I'll come and talk to you about that, but we have excellent expectations that we're going to be able to reduce our health care costs so we can reallocate a part of our already tight operating budget into other areas such as teacher salaries, additional teachers in areas such as career and technical education, so on and so forth. I guess I don't want to have that that's not the point of this conversation here, but it's a good question. I will come and talk to you about that, okay? Uh, Matt. So uh, this, is, this is, I think, more of a production. With the expansion of the CTE or the, the technical wing over there, is that going to allow for additional modernized, or modernized classes to be offered, uh, so it's engineering-based, uh, robotics-based classes that we don't have today? Yeah, so the question was, with that additional CT spaces, would that allow for more modernization of our spaces, more expansion of our courses? And the answer would be yes. We would be able to bring robotics, such as our robotics team is in there right now, we'd be able to bring them back into the building. We would have more space for them to actually uh, practice and compete, not just work on our machines. Uh, we would be able to expand our opportunities within autos because we would have more flexibility with how we can be we can be more intentional about how we design the space so that we can accommodate more students at a time in, this, in, in the auto shop. It will also expand our manufacturing, our advanced manufacturing now can expand into where they currently are because now building trays can expand over across the hall into where our current autos is. So it, it is a trickle effect. We can continue to grow all across the board by doing that. Your curriculum will increase. Correct. And the, with CTE, curriculum is looked at yearly because obviously the thing, demands are always changing based on market needs and what our local community, partners such as you, what your demands are, we want to try to meet those needs so our kids are prepared once they leave the money bicycle. Additional educators as well to support the growth of the program? Would we need additional educators? I can't answer if we would need additional educators based off of how much growth that would go. We do, we have expanded our CT offerings and our FTE has grown by four and a half teachers over the course of the last six years. Now that's not bringing on additional staff that's reallocating our FTE. So if a teacher retires in an area that may have not grown as much, we have allocated, like we have reallocated that into a CT space and do one of the electives. All right, so with the last five minutes here, we're gonna ask you guys one more question, which we'll turn it over to you guys here. So if you're taking a look at the far right-hand side of your sheet, we've obviously, have, I have no doubt in my mind, overwhelmed you with a lot of different options. Again, we pushed all ideas on the table. Now we would like to hear from you. Now we'll work at our fourth meeting to kind of ask more particular questions, but at this point, we're just trying to understand from the community Financially speaking, what might there be support for? So as we take a look at breakout session number three here, we're, we're asking you to pick option one, two, or three. So after better understanding everything, the elementary, middle school, and high school needs, what level of tax impact do you believe the Mabuanago community would support for these projects? So option one is a project in the range of 76 to 103 million that would result in no increase to the referendum tax levy. We spent a lot of time about that earlier. It's dependent on how much general aid the state is willing to provide to our operating budget. And if the state provides a lot of support, then our operating tax levy will go low, which affords a greater opportunity to raise the referendum debt levy, all while keeping your overall taxes decreasing by 0.2%. I get that that was not easy material, and I'll be happy to come around and talk with you about it. We will focus on that conversation again in two weeks as we wrap this up. But we do have the opportunity to do a project between 76 million and 103 million without raising your current tax levels. 
We would just be asking for your support to continue them on into the future. Option two is a project, a total project of 130 million that would result in an annual increase to the referendum tax levy totaling between $48 and $92 per $100,000 of a house value. So $130, uh, excuse me, $130 million would give the opportunity to do a number of different projects, such as if we were to renovate our middle school for $85 million, and to do, when we think back to the elementary options, of doing the reduced scope option, okay, and then also projects here at Guanago High School. When we get to the $130 million range, that is going to have a tax levy increase. There's no way around that. Would you be willing to support that? Please speak freely, we want to hear from the community. And then finally we have option three. So option three, we're giving too much information for your sheet, so we're putting this on, on the screen here. So if you are going to support a project in excess of 130 million, okay? We anticipate, so as I gave options of seven, eight, and nine million dollars of a referendum tax levy this fall, I think it's going to be eight, that's my guess. So if that holds true, we see some values on the screen, all right? If we did a project for $130 million, all right, that would be $70 uh, increase to uh, per $100,000 of house property value each year for 20 more years. As we add $5 million to the scope of the project, you can see the accompanying raising of taxes. We're looking for input on tax tolerance. Once we understand that, we'll begin to use NextMean to prioritize what do you want us to do. It's important we hear from you and it's important that your voices are heard and that is the purpose of this. Clint, is there anything else that we need to discuss here? Kurt? Okay. So if you would please take the time to give us your input on option one, two, or three. If you're choosing option three, let us know where you would support. Once you have that filled out, you can just leave it on the table, and then you can go. We thank you guys for coming here. We will be coming, our next meeting will be in two weeks at Clarendon as we wrap this up. Thank you guys.